Today on the future of everything, the future of our oceans. Anyone who's looked at a globe, a, a, a world globe, Earth globe, knows that most of the Earth is covered with water in the oceans. Oceans have been on our mind recently because they are rising and we are worried about the future of flooding because they seem like they are polluted, especially by plastics and other human generated uh, waste, and because they seem to be contributing to strange weather patterns, warming, cooling, storms, many other things. Oceans, of course, are also the homes of an amazing diversity of life, from algae and plankton to sharks to huge uh, whales. These ecosystems are not only affected by warming, but also things like the carbon dioxide levels, chemical changes, and many other pressures that change the living conditions of ocean life. And of course, these changes affect humans both directly and indirectly in many ways. I think most concretely, our access to healthy fish for food can be jeopardized by pollution, temperature changes, and changes in the chemical composition. But more generally, it can change the overall health of the ocean life and the life of the whole planet. Professor Fienza Micheli is a professor of biology and marine science and a senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Theo, where does your deep interest in oceans come from and what are the big scientific challenges in understanding the ocean that are facing you and your colleagues these days? Thank you for uh, having me here, Russ. So I, uh, no, I started being on, interested in oceans as far back as I can remember. As a kid, uh, I, growing up in Italy by the Mediterranean Sea, I spent a lot of time by the sea and in the water, and I was just fascinated with uh, marine life. And then uh, uh, when I found out that that could be uh, my profession, that could become a profession, basically I took that path and never looked back. And I feel uh, uh, I have the dream, the, a dream job, basically. And in, no, nothing, uh, uh, I couldn't hope for anything more, better than this. It is extremely fun to review mm -hmm. your publications because there are so many topics that are fascinating. But let's, let's go to one mm -hmm. that I think you've been working on recently. I know there's many things you've been working on. But uh, one is the effect of uh, carbon dioxide on biodiversity and on life itself. And there's many other things that I want to get to. But I know, if I understand, one of the things you've done is you've gone to these naturally occurring sources of carbon dioxide and looked like close to them, medium and far, what are the impacts on ocean life? Can you tell us about what motivated that work and what did you find? Yes, ocean acidification, you were asking, what are the... Acidification, Yeah, yes. what are the big challenges? Well, one is climate change and ocean acidification. So oceans absorb uh, um, uh, about 30% of the carbon dioxide we produce no, since industrial revolution. And so they, they play a very important role in buffering no, uh, the atmosphere from these increases, but then no, they are, at the same time they are impacted. The seawater is becoming more acidic, yes. and this is affecting marine life. So to uh, get a better understanding of what does this means and what are the implications for marine biodiversity and marine life, we are using uh, uh, underwater carbon dioxide vents as a natural laboratory. Okay. These are places in the southern part of Italy where I'm from, so it's How very convenient. convenient. Yes, <laughs> I can go there and then sort of hop on home and s say hi to everyone. So is th when you say south, mm -hmm. is this like Sicily or not uh, quite? Naples, the Naples. Gulf of okay. Naples. So in Naples, there's two, in the Gulf of Naples, there's two little islands, Capri and Ischia. And uh, um, uh, around the coast of Ischia, which is a volcanically active areas, uh, there's essentially cracks in the bottom of the sea from which the carbon dioxide bubbles up. It looks like a jacuzzi. Okay. And the, these bubbles of carbon dioxide, as they come in contact with the water, acidify the water. And as you were explaining, next to the vents, where the emission is really intense, the pH, a measure of the, acidif of the acidity of yes. the water, is very low, extremely low. Far lower than we expect, uh, even under the most dire projection to the end of this century. Okay. A little farther away, 
it gets to levels that we anticipate seeing in our oceans in the next decades. And then so it's almost like a preview of yeah. the future. We call it a crystal ball. Crystal ball. It's basically, it's a, you know, a voyage to the future of the ocean that we can use to see not only uh, um, how individual species respond to acidification, which scientists have been um, investigating in the laboratory, for example, but how whole ecosystems respond, because entire reef ecosystems are exposed to yes. these gradients. And what we found is that uh, uh, acidification, even at these moderate levels that we anticipate seeing relatively soon, uh, uh, diversity declines. We lose many species, but we don't lose all species. We talk about winners and losers yes. because there are, in fact, species that actually do better because they don't have predators or competitors, for example. So if you can figure out how to sustain yourself in that low pH area, you there's can some thrive. upside. Yes, there's some upside. But unfortunately, when you're looking at the whole system and how it functions, how it works, there is an overall loss. Mm -hmm. So even though some species thrive, those that are impacted, negatively impacted, tend to be species that provide habitat for other species, food. They regulate the systems through their predation activities. Yes. And so the net result is a loss of what we call functional redundancy, a measure of uh, the extent to which species are interchangeable in their role in the ecosystem, in their ecological role. You get worried if the diversity is too low because then you have a mm -hmm. single point of failure exactly. of the ecosystem. It one, one bad virus or yeah. whatever, yeah. and then the whole thing can go yeah. down very the fast. The food webs become shorter, the, the, the ecosystem becomes less complex, and it becomes vulnerable because uh, there's just fewer options. Yes. Basically, that's now, the. Do you see um, evolution? Do you see? I don't know if the time scales of this are compatible with having the organisms actually evolve and change their DNA in response to these environments. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions are, uh, that that people ask is, is global warming happening too fast for mm -hmm. organisms to adapt? And I, I would guess you might get some data on this question. So I don't know. The, the events we have been working at are too new. Okay. Really, too, because they, pos they probably resulted from a small earthquake that happened just 20 years ago. Ah, oh, they released. okay. And so we have a but in other systems, yes, there is evidence of uh, some c adaptation capacity, but the question remains, is change happening too fast? And indeed, uh, it is. We are seeing in a new analysis we just published, we um, uh, looked at the cumulative impact from climate change, acidification, and other pressures like yes. fishing and co pollution on the ocean. And over the past decade, in about 60% of the oceans, the cumulative impact has increased significantly. So this is very, very fast. Yes. Just in a few years, we are seeing an expansion. So it brings up the question, is there enough time? Right. And uh, so this is the future of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Fio Micheli about oceans. Uh, and I wanted to move from carbon dioxide acidification and the impacts there, which um, in summary were uh, a concerning loss of diversity. I know that you also look at what I find to be a very interesting uh, human ocean interaction with fishing. And I know you've done a lot of work in this area. First of all, what's the issue with fishing? Because there's many potential issues. So what are the ones that you focus on? And then I'd love to hear, because I, I know that you've also made some interventions, almost experiments of uh, with nature and humans to, to try to uh, mm -hmm. address these problems. So please. Yes, yeah, so fishing and more generally uh, production of seafood from the ocean is one of the most important services, one of the most important benefits that we get from the ocean. Uh, and the problem with fishing is that we fish too much. It's and too delicious. Yes, it's too <laughs> delicious. We fish too much and we don't fish well. We fish with sometimes with uh, uh, gear and uh, no, and in places that cause damage. So the the trends in fishing are, are unsustainable. And the amount of catch that we produce worldwide has leveled off in the 90s. 
And despite increases in effort, we spend more time, we have bigger boats, we go farther away, we are still not catching more. So that shows that... That's very at the, concerning. Yes. At this rate, we have... So a fisherman have, from 50 years ago would, yeah. would have a day and he would wonder, why is this my worst day ever? Yes, exactly. And we've seen this shifting baseline, we call it, where people, not the best day years ago uh, uh, is unthinkable now. And the worst day is the norm now. So that is... So so that is the problem. Uh, uh, the solutions include protection, paradoxically, protecting parts of the ocean uh, results in you more mean fish. Saying, Please don't fish here anymore. Yes. And I'm sure that's very popular. And it's, yes. <laughs> Although it's, uh, it's happening now uh, at uh, higher rates, so uh, protection is expanding, but not fast enough. And the idea is to set aside portions of the ocean to just let fishes basically recover and ecosystems recover. Yes. recover. And uh, the establishment of protected areas or marine protected areas not only can benefit fishing, but has been shown to provide some resilience from climate impacts. And the way we have seen this work in marine reserves here in the California current, where we, we have been working for, for uh, over 15 years now, is that uh, essentially if you don't catch fishes or other marine creatures, they become bigger. They are older and bigger. Okay. And this results in a disproportionate uh, uh, reproductive output. They produce way more eggs when they're larger than when they're smaller. So a big fish is a productive fish. Yes. And they're called the, the boffs, the big old fecund fishes. There is actually a term. F-S. <laughs> These larger uh, super producers are really important in the populations because we have seen that with mass mortality associated with climate change and particularly hypoxia, when the oxygen levels in the water uh, become too low and animals suffocate and die, the few that survive, the buffs that survive, actually make up for the loss of the others. The babies that they produce are so plentiful huh. that they replenish the, the area, both in the re in marine, pro marine protected areas and around them, because in the ocean, eggs and larvae disperse with currents, and so they are taken so elsewhere. So these are hugely important. So they are very um, important. They're almost like, a, I'm thinking of like pluripotent stem cells that can repopulate yes. a population. It's an important it's engine. Disproportionately yes. important. And so that is very important. And then the other approaches that have been uh, shown great success in fisheries are actually allocating rights to people. So um, often fishing is is what we call an open access system. Yeah. People go if out and can fish. Get there, you yeah, can you fish. can fish. If you can get in the middle of the ocean, you go in the middle of the ocean. But increasingly, uh, approaches to fisheries management have included rights, where people have territories where they're the only one who can fish or get assigned a quota of the catch. It's called individual transferable quotas, and this creates incentives for better fishing, yes. there's a stake in maintaining the resources in the long term, and so these have also proved uh, uh, effective. So in, just so I understand, in this case, are you actually giving a, a geographically defined, like by GPS, region, almost like a farm on land, yes. but this is like a farm in the sea, yep. and then the individual fisher person has to decide do I overfish and risk the value of my plot, or do I be a little bit more moderate to try to make sure that the long-term value is maintained? That's exactly right. And interestingly, often it's not the case of individual fishers, but it's cooperatives mm -hmm. or coalitions. And so there, is, there are communities that come together to make this kind of decisions. Where this do we... This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Fio Micheli about uh, fisheries right now. Uh, and I wanted to ask for these protected regions, one of the, uh, I love the idea that science can inform this because it makes sense as a general idea, but of course the details matter. How big of an area must be protected to have a, a, a meaningful impact on the quality? Because I can imagine like if it's five feet by five feet, this is a ridiculous example, a five feet protected area will do nothing. And I don't know if it needs to be 10 mile region or 20 mile region. What is the science telling us about the minimal productive size of a protected area? 
uh, that varies greatly depending on the characteristics of okay. the species of the habitat. But uh, in uh, um, in marine scene, we were talking about dispersal. Yes. The fact that animals and larvae and materials can disperse longer distance in the ocean can be used to build networks of small protected areas mm. that as a whole uh, function basically as a unit to protect uh, species and fisheries over large scale. And so California in the United States yes. was a pioneer in establishing one of the first uh, networks of protected areas. So when you say network, coastwide. Is like a series of islands that are kind of close enough so that the fish yes. can move between them and essentially have a larger protected range yes. without having to protect the entire region. That's exactly right. Yes. That's a great idea. Yes. And I'm and sure that I'm mathematical. I can imagine mathematicians getting very excited oh, about yes. this. Done all sorts of modeling exercise and understanding where and how much and how far away. And But uh, um, um, it, it's an approach to protect in very large area while at the same time allowing for uses yes. without excluding people from fishing or for recreational uses over very large areas of the coast. And, and then increasingly protection is established uh, um, offshore. And uh, I, we've been working with Center for Ocean Solutions recently and partners on this case of Palau, the Republic of Palau in the Western Pacific, yes. that uh, as of uh, January 1st, a month ago, has established one of the largest protected areas in their uh, waters. It's, uh, the si it's, it's larger than the whole state of California. And it surrounds this island? It surrounds, we call it Donut Sanctuary. Donut. It surrounds uh, the archipelago and leaves area around the land and a little strip going out into the high seas open to fishing for the development and use of Palawan fisheries. Fascinating. So uh, this, w what, what, what was it about this island and their leadership and their population that enabled what sounds like a, a huge societal decision? Um, were they at were they at risk or were they suffering and seeing imminent uh, problems? Yes, yeah, small island nations uh, are uh, uh, perhaps among the most vulnerable system because uh, they depend on oceans for everything, and they're also very vulnerable to climate change and sea level rise. And so basically, there's really no other place yes. to go. And so because small island nations, increasingly, we call them big ocean states because yes. they depend and manage and own such vast areas of the ocean. And so uh, among small island nations, Palau has been a leader leader in protection, starting with the establishment of coastal network of, of small yes. marine protected areas, and uh, and then now moving into the high seas with establishing protection of, uh, you know, of their waters and important fisheries like tuna fisheries. Did this require them to address uh, uh, changes in um, international uh, ocean r laws, because you know there. Are, I know there are rules about how far out from your coast you can claim dominion, and did they have to bend some of those rules in order to protect the the surrounding air water? In the case of Palau, the protection concerns their exclusive economic zone, uh, in which they have jurisdiction. But uh, increasingly, um, we are looking to areas beyond national jurisdiction, yes. in the high seas and protection in the high seas. And I've been recently involved in an establishment of a protected area in the Mediterranean, in fact, in the Adriatic Sea, in the high seas, outside of the territorial jurisdiction of countries. So this, uh, the area now, uh, protects uh, um, uh, an area of the seafloor from trawling, from mm -hmm. uh, bottom trawling, which is used as a fishing uh, type that uses gear that destroys the bottom, essentially. And it's waters comprised between the, the territorial waters of Italy and Croatia. Yes. And so there are now also mechanisms, legal mechanisms and treaties that allow the establishment of protected areas beyond the, the EZs, the exclusive economic zones. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Professor Fiorenza Micheli about the oceans, the seas, fisheries, next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Fiorenza Micheli about oceans, fishes, 
uh, and ocean life and biodiversity. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to turn in this part of our conversation to some of the work you've done on specific species, species of interest or species that are easier for you to study. And one, of course, everybody loves to think about sharks. And I know you've published about sharks. Uh, what is special about sharks as a target organism for you to study? Uh, and what have we learned about the impacts of all of these multiple pressures on shark life? Well, sharks are interesting uh, uh, because uh, it's an ancient group of species. They've been around for a very long time, but their life history, their life cycle makes them very vulnerable to overfishing and other impacts. They uh, mature late in life, they produce few you know, youngs, uh, and now they're the target of shark finning, which is a really valuable uh, so there are commodity. cultures that value yes, that, that pieces value of the shark. Pieces of the sharks and then results in, in the death of too many sharks for what this population can sustain. The reason also we we're fascinated by them is that they play a really important role in ecosystems. As predators, uh, they um, can set in motion a cascade of interactions that goes all the way down to the reef. Huh. Their presence uh, by scaring other species and their uh, uh, feeding activity affects the whole ecosystem. They also connect the distant system. In work we have done with gray reef sharks in the Line Islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we found that sharks spend time on reefs, they're called reef sharks, but they also feed uh, offshore. In the uh, no, far away, and so they connect different ecosystems and draw on the productivity huh. of a much larger ecosystems. And so, as a result, many uh, unexploited ecosystems, marine ecosystems, are what we call top heavy. A lot of the biomass is at the top of the, the big, food the web. Big animals. It's almost an inverted pyramid. We tend to think of food webs as a pyramid, right. but it's really the other way around. And so as we deplete sharks, we alter, not, we not only we impact their populations that are endangered in many cases, but we also alter the functioning of whole ecosystems. Now, are these, inver you, you describe this inverted uh, pyramid. Uh, is that an unstable situation or can that be stable? It just seems to me counterintuitive that it could ever work because if you have too many predators and not enough prey, uh, that doesn't seem like it's going to work for very long. But are there stable systems yeah, that, the that reason are inverted? The, yes, the reason the systems uh, are stable is that the uh, top of the, of the food web draws energy on a much larger area. Uh -huh. And so they don't depend on the productivity of that, just that focal ecosystem, but it's much, they're mobile and they feed on a much larger area. In fact, they connect uh, distant ecosystems like offshore and reef ecosystems. So in some ways, it sounds like you're saying that if we study sharks, it's a way to biopsy the health of the yes. entire ecosystem. So uh, referring back to our previous discussion, with th that suggests to me that if you have these protected areas, the sharks in those areas might be like doing well. Yes, they're sentinels of the health of the ocean, along with many other uh, species and habitats. For example, species that form important habitats like coral reefs and mangrove forests and seagrass beds or kelp forests here in California. I think the, those species that are called foundation species and the predators are uh, the sentinels of how healthy an ecosystem yes, is. This, is. this makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Theo Mikke about uh, sharks uh, uh, and other things. So I wanted to also ask uh, two, two areas that I want to go to. One is, um, I believe you've studied the impact of, uh, uh, of fish, uh, fish farms, where uh, they create, I guess, um, enclosed areas where they grow salmon or, or shrimp, uh, and the impacts of the, on the ecosystem of these. Uh, I wanted to find out about wh where we are there, because I know that there are now scorecards that come out about things that you can eat, and it's not always uh, easy to guess what the answer is. And so I just wonder if you have things to say about the safety, the food supply of farmed fish and farmed sea products. So farming, uh, no, aquaculture and mariculture are incredibly important uh, means of addressing food security. 
so the production. So um, uh, recent uh, estimates uh, uh, tell us that the potential of growth for producing seed is in aquaculture and, macro- and, okay. and mariculture. So doing that well, doing it in the right places with the right procedure is incredibly important because there's a lot at stake. Uh, some aquaculture operations have environmental impact, destroy coastal habitat, uh, use antibiotic and other substances that are toxic it's to like us. It's like cows all over again. Yes. So I think we can learn from <laughs> land maybe on how to do it better. Uh, so th- there are you know, several important aspects of this. One is that uh, even the most sustainable operations at some point, at some scales, can cause impact. Work we've done uh, uh, in uh, um, in China, in Sango Bay, shows that the very large operations that exist there, whole bays basically uh. employ for this, uh, at some point result in the decreased productivity of the system. It's just too much taken out of it. So we need to un- better understand and really do the science in collaboration with the producers to understand yes. what is the, you now how Im- can we improve on the feed used, uh, what are practices that are that result in sustainable and healthy seafood. So a lot to be done there. Organization like Seafood Watch, which is based at Monterey Bay Aquarium, Marine Stewardship Council, are developing standards, way of assessing the sustainability and health yes. of these, are these operations. Are the ones that may have given me yeah. my little, my little so scorecards? So those are the cards, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's basically telling consumers, but also businesses, companies that trade seafood, what, no, where we are on the right path yes. and where instead improvements are needed. And that color scale signals that progression from red to green. This um, image that you've painted, I really mm-hmm. like that as we think about the ocean, we might want to think about this network and there'll be areas where there are fisheries and farms. There'll be protected areas. There'll be other areas. Um, but I wanted to end by asking you about technology and the ways in which technology is helping us make the kinds of measurements and observations that are important for your work. Yeah, one, one of the major challenges with oceans is that they're enormous. And so it's very hard to know what's happening. A recent revolution involves technologies, for example, vessel tracking systems that were initially developed as anti-collision devices for safety, uh, now allow us to see uh, what is happening in the oceans everywhere. Uh, where there's fishing, where there's deep sea mining, where there's uh, f- um, uh, transportation. Most boats so, ha- are labeled with one of these uh, transponders? So most boats uh, above a certain size. Ah, okay. So uh, large boats uh, uh, have uh, mandatory use of these systems, uh, but smaller boats don't. So there is a lot to be done in developing the technology that will allow us to track all vessels, all activities. But uh, Global Fishing Watch, this yes. organization that is tracking large vessels, has developed this incredible resource and uh, uh, database that is updated in real time. And this uh, is just the tip of the iceberg of many technological development. Inexpensive technologies for monitoring uh, water quality like yes. pH and oxygen yes. and uh, uh, um, technologies like environmental DNA that allow us to establish the diversity in the water and also the quality L- of the literally food. like DNA sequencing yeah. of a, of a of, scoop of ocean of, yeah a liter of water and you can see what's being so th- there's so much that is happening now this is such an exciting time and, uh, and you now at the same time we need to ramp up the pace of solutions and uh, and you know innovation for ocean. And so all of this is happening right now. So there's going to be this great, like many yeah. other areas, we're going to have a big data for ocean. Yes. Uh, and, and, and we're going to try to address the questions that we've been discussing. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.